Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. As Claire indicated, I'm Mark Jacobs. I'm an environmental lawyer. I've been representing the Detroit Water and Sewer Department on sewer environmental issues and sewer rate making issues since 1989. I don't know. Then I'll have to speak up. Okay. I thought these were doing something. Sorry. Um, in any event, Jeff and I kind of broke this Great Lakes Water Authority discussion up into two pieces. I'm going to talk about wh what led to the formation of the Great Lakes Water Authority in the first place. And Jeff, coming from the Southeast and Oakland County Water Authority, who will be a customer of the Great Lakes Water Authority, is going to speak about what the authority is, what it does, how it works, and, and, and presenting it from the perspective of someone who's going to be a customer of the authority going forward. Um, preliminary information, you know, it's not like the Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties who are members of the Great Lakes Water Authority haven't always wanted to get control over the Detroit Water and Sewer Department. They always have. There's been, I went back and looked, at least 10 or 12 bills introduced in the Michigan legislature over the last 20 years that would have taken the, De the Detroit Water and Sewer Department away from the city and transfer it to any number of different types of organizations, authorities, what have you. Um, only one of those ever passed the legislature, but Governor Angle refused to sign it. Um, so there's always been a real interest in taking over the Water and Sewer Department, but there's never been any willingness to pay dime one to get it. And, and in this case, the, there will be a lease payment of $50 million dollars not all of which will be borne by the suburban customers, but a substantial portion of it will be. So what, what, what convinced the, the suburbs that it was worth paying a lot of money to get, you know, a modicum of additional control over the water and sewer department? I'm going to try and give you some of my thoughts on what were the drivers for getting them there. DWSD provides wholesale sewer services, that's to the suburbs, to about 18 municipal customers. Uh, with Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb counties representing the vast majority of the consumption of the sewer system. It also provides wholesale water service to, I think, around 85 uh, municipal customers. And DWSD has always had an excellent relationship with its water customers. There have been one or two skirmishes that have broken out over the last 30 or 40 years that have ended up in litigation, but they've been very few and far between. Unlike the water customers, DWSD has been basically at war with Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County over sewer rates uh, going back to 1977 and even earlier. And I went back and thought about how we got over this threshold and, and I identified what I think are three contributing factors. The first and obviously is the wholesale sewer customers complete distrust of the way that DWSD sets sewer rates. They think they're setting rates that allow them to funnel money into the city or that pass costs on that should be borne by the Detroit retail customers and forcing it on the suburban customers. And, and to aggravate that, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the counties have always felt underrepresented on the Detroit Water Board. Their attitude is, is that we're consuming roughly 50% of the total sewer services produced by the city of Detroit, and we have very little, if any, control over how the rates are set. So that perceived or actual lack of control over rate practices and the complete distrust over the way Detroit sets its rates are one of the drivers, I think, that led us to the point where we are today. A second factor that I think pushed the counties was DWSD's proven track record of an inability to comply with environmental law at the wastewater treatment plant. Going back to 1977, and I'll review the history a bit, because it's, it's painfully redundant to go over it, uh, to, to operate in compliance. And it's always been the same problems. It's always been the same causes. The federal courts who have overseen the, the department for 35 years or more have done everything they could think of to do to keep them in compliance. And hardly any of it has shown any uh, success. And then finally, the, probably the biggest factor that got us to where we are today is the Detroit bankruptcy. The, um, 
the city's emergency manager, Kevin Orr, some of you may be familiar with, and the city's financial advisors, Miller Buckfire, felt that the, this was a, the bankruptcy was a real opportunity to try and find a way to sell or lease the Detroit Water and Sewer Department in exchange for very large payments to the city of Detroit. And I think their interest in generating revenues for, revenues for the city was perhaps the biggest driver. But at the same time, it was a big obstacle for the suburbs who didn't want to pay any money for it. So starting with the rate making practices, the Water Board, the, under the Detroit Charter, the Detroit Water Board is governed by seven members. They're appointed by the governor, I mean, they're appointed by the mayor, and four of the seven by, by the charter have to come from the city of Detroit. Originally, the suburbs had uh, no representation on the board. In the 1970s, as some of these rate issues started to bubble up, McComb and Young agreed to give the, uh, the Wayne Oakland and McComb counties each the right to appoint a single member on the board. So three of the seven would be from the suburbs. Who got the non-suburbs? <laughs> I'm going to get there. The way it worked was that the suburbs would submit, submit a list of five or ten names and the mayor would select one from each county to sit on the board. Um, while that practice continued until just recently, um, it was never satisfactory to the counties. They felt that because the uh, board members serve at the pleasure of the mayor, which means they can be fired for any reason or no reason, and because they didn't really have choices over who was sitting on the board or who was representing them, that it didn't satisfy their desire to get control over the way the rates were being set. But the battle over sewer rates really bubbled up big time when the US EPA sued the city of Detroit in federal court in Detroit in 1977 over wide-ranging non-compliance of the wastewater treatment plant. I mean, the place was literally in shambles. There were all sorts of new legal requirements that they were required to meet and had failed to meet by the uh, established deadlines. EPA was seeking an order from the federal court that would require, one, Detroit to make massive improvements to the plant and its operations of the plant, and two, to set rates that would generate revenue sufficient to make those improvements at the plant. Well, EPA alleged in their complaint a bunch of reasons that were causing the noncompliance. Inadequate staff, remember these. Inadequate training, you're going to hear it over and over again. Inadequate equipment and uh, equipment maintenance untimely purchasing of parts and equipment, and inadequate rates to pay for the proper operation and maintenance of the uh, plant. So obviously, if EPA were to prevail, and it's obvious that it was going to prevail because it was right, the suburbs got real nervous about how it was going to affect water, I mean sewer rates. Oakland County was the first one to make a move, and about two months after the lawsuit was filed, Oakland County moved to intervene in the lawsuit and Judge Fikens, who the case had been assigned to, recognized that Oakland County wasn't the only one with concerns about the effects of this lawsuit on sewer rates. And so he ordered all of Detroit's uh, wholesale sewer customers to be joined as parties to this lawsuit. So now they're all there. Everybody's at the party. The rates are going up. And the battles began. Over the next 35 years, there must have been, and Judge Corton's in Judge Fikens courtroom, you don't start a lawsuit by filing a complaint like you do in any other courtroom. When you have a problem, you file a motion. And there were probably 20 or 30 motions filed over those 35 years complaining about various things that Detroit was doing with its sewer rates. Over that same period of time, those issues were resolved in about a half a dozen rate settlement agreements. And they addressed all sorts of fine points of how sewer rates are set some of which are, most of which are way too technical to get into in this kind of a discussion. But the types of bigger, higher level issues that were, they were fighting over, just to give you an example, there were questions about who should pay for the cost of Detroit's uncollected sewer bills inside the city of Detroit, and who should pay for the costs of the uncollected Highland Park sewer bills, both of which were very high. The way that was resolved is that Detroit eats Detroit bad debt, and the wholesale suburban customers eat suburban bad, bad debt, including Highland Park. So you can hear Highland Park is behind on all their uh, sewer bills, like to the tune of $25 million right now. We're all paying for that. But that's the deal that was struck. Um, tip another kind of issue, the Detroit had a 
a practice, and it was technically authorized by law, of charging the suburban customers more money for sewer services than it charged people inside the city of Detroit. Well, as you would expect, the suburban communities didn't like that. And it was ultimately agreed that Detroit would set the same rates for inside the Detroit customers as for outside the Detroit customers. There was a battle that lasted uh, probably six or seven years. If you're familiar with combined sewer overflows and what it costs to control them, well, there were, the suburbs were real concerned that the two and a half to three billion dollars that it was going to cost to fix combined sewer overflows inside the city of Detroit would get passed on to them. And they didn't want to pay any of it. I mean, Detroit ratepayers don't pay for CSO control outside the city. So after years of technical analysis and all sorts of control modeling, and a business deal was cut where the customers in the suburbs pay 17% of those costs and Detroit ratepayers Detroit rate payers pay 83% of it. And then there were, you know, there's a long list of things I could go through, but those were the types of issues that people were fighting over when it came to Detroit, Detroit's rate making practices. And in any event, the, cost, the, the county's desire to get control over the, over the sewer rate making practices, I think was one of the key drivers that led to the formation of the DLWA. Then we get to Detroit's long proven track record of non-compliance with the wastewater treatment plan. As I said, in 77, the lawsuit started. It was resolved that same year by the entry of a consent judgment that required the city of Detroit to make massive improvements at the wastewater treatment plant and to raise its rates to cover those. Well, with, within two years, it was obvious that Detroit was not going to comply with the consent judgment. And Judge Fikens appointed a committee to do some investigation, and what they found was the same thing that EPA alleged in its complaint, inadequate staffing, in, inadequate training, inadequate maintenance, inadequate purchasing, over and over and over again. But they also, they also discovered one other problem. The reason DWSD was having such problems in those areas is that it had to rely on the city of Detroit to perform the functions of human resources, of, of purchasing, of financing. It wasn't, it had no autonomy in those areas, and the city's processes were completely inadequate. They may have been adequate for a city, but they weren't adequate for a municipal utility. So Judge Fikens did two things. First, he appointed Coleman Young as a special administrator of the Water and Sewer Department. A special administrator had all the powers to do anything the city could do. Coleman Young could purchase, he could hire, he could fire, he could finance, he could borrow money could enter into contracts, could do anything that he wanted to do, didn't have to go through the city council, didn't have to deal with any of the city departments. So it was a way to work around the city. And second, EPA and DWSD entered into an amended consent judgment with a new schedule to meet the timetables and the obligations outlined in the original consent judgment. It took five years till 1984 that DWSD finally met most of the requirements of the amended consent judgment. Cohen Young was discharged from his job as a special administrator, and Judge Fikens retained jurisdiction over the case because he suspected there were going to be no problems going forward. Well, he wasn't entirely wrong. Fourteen years later, in 1998, I'd been working on this case for ten years by that point, um, DWSD once again fell completely out of compliance. I mean, I could tell you what was going on at the plant, but trust me, it was a terrible mess. They couldn't get the solids out of the plant, and you can't get the solids out of the plant. They back up everywhere. They pile up everywhere. It's not a pleasant sight. So the court appointed another committee to investigate the causes, and what did it do? It found out purchasing, staffing, training, all connected to the city of Detroit and its processes that were inadequate to, to uh, serve the, the, the utility. So once again, Judge Fikens appointed another special administrator. This time it was Judge Den Mayor Dennis Archer. And DWSD entered into a second amended consent judgment with a whole bunch of additional requirements to get the plant back into compliance. That was in 1998. Um, well, that was actually in 2000. In 2002, Kwame Kilpatrick became mayor, and he succeeded to Dennis Archer in his role as special administrator. And I think you can also imagine what Kwame may have done with all those broad powers that he was given. By 2006, Detroit's back into compliance again. Mayor Kilpatrick is discharged from the role of special administrator. And guess what? Three years later, 2009, 
as Judge Fife and said when we went in to talk to him, well, guys, it looks like we're back in the grease again. Shortly thereafter, Judge Fikens retired. The case was assigned to Judge Cox. But Judge Cox appointed a root cause committee. The root cause committee was charged to figure out what was going on, and I don't have to tell you what they found. <laughs> but this time, this time they made a they they, they made a, a, a new recommendation that had never been made before. They recommended that Detroit largely be made functionally independent of the city of Detroit be given its own legal department, its own purchasing, its own human resources, its own finance, so that it didn't have to work through the city anymore. Sounded like a great idea. Over the next several years, Judge Cox, ish Cox issued about a half a dozen orders granting powers to the Detroit Water and Sewer Department to do things independently of the cities and created a new structure on the board that gave the counties a larger voice so that they could take charge and prevent this non-compliance issues from occurring yet again. Um, everything was looking pretty good at the time, but when Judge Cox got satisfied that this new structure was working, he dismissed the case, and the city of Detroit appealed all of Judge Cox's orders. The city didn't like the idea that its control over the department had largely been taken away from it, and that appeal's pending in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals right now, and there's very good reason to believe that the Sixth Circuit would overturn turn those orders because the judge went really far out on a limb to, to create the type of autonomy that Detroit is currently enjoying. So the counties, concerned that DWSD could end up dependent on the city of Detroit once again if Judge Cox's orders were reversed, had a real strong interest in seeing to it that an independent authority took over the operation of the city to prevent these reoccurrences of noncompliance. And then, as I said, the third and probably biggest matter that drove us to the point where we are today was the Detroit bankruptcy. As you probably know, in July 2013, Detroit filed for bankruptcy protection. There was already had been appointed an emergency manager, Kevin Orr, and they had financial advisors involved, an outfit called Miller Buckfire, and who had already begun efforts to try and sell or lease the department to a third party. Um, the concept that they had in their mind is that if you transferred the authority to the DWSD to an independent third party, the independent third party would operate more efficiently, that they'd have better bond rating, that they'd be able to toss off a lot of legacy costs that DWSD had, so the cost of running the system would go down by so much that they could afford to make very large payments to the city of Detroit for, in exchange for the lease or purchase. I mean, the numbers that they initially laid out were on the order of $1.2 billion in payments over the first nine years. As you can imagine, the counties were not real happy about those kinds of numbers. They were sure that if they, those kind of payments were proposed or were made, it would result in massive uh, rate increases, which the one thing they don't want to let happen. Um, so the uh, Miller Buck Fire and Kevin Orr got communities together and all the lawyers and the counties and the cities were together and we tried to negotiate for about a year an agreement to transfer this uh, operation to an independent authority. And after, I don't know how many thousands of hours were spent on this, probably tens of thousands of hours, the parties were unable to come to an agreement. And the biggest issue was really money. Again, the, the, the suburban customer said, we don't see how we can make a dime of payment without it affecting the rates. They didn't believe the finance people that there were all sorts of savings that would be realized. Some of them are really, really, are actually real, but we couldn't reach an agreement. That was reported out to the bankruptcy judge, Judge Rhodes, who was uh, very upset to hear that. He had been hoping that this arrangement would get some money for the city. And he didn't take it lying down. He ordered the city and the counties into mediation on the creation of an independent authority. He appointed Judge Cox, of course, as the mediator, who was completely familiar with what was going on. And after about six months of mediation, in September of 2014, the parties emerged, oh, I should tell you, there was a gag order. You know, it's a gag order, it's a confidentiality order. None of the parties to the um, mediation were allowed to talk to anybody. Pr Attorneys couldn't report to principals. Principals couldn't report to their constituents. It was very uncomfortable for everybody involved. Uh, 
to, to uh, get around a lot of the attorney-client issues where most of the attorneys were excluded entirely from the process. But in September 2014, the parties announced they had a deal. They walked out of court one day with a signed memorandum of understanding. The Jeff will tell you what it does. But it outlines the general terms on which a Great Lakes Water Authority would be established. And then over the next few months, everything started moving towards being finalized. In November 2014, they filed the Articles of Incorporation. So now the Great Lakes Water Authority is a real legal entity. And this past June, the Great Lakes Water Authority signed leases with the city of Detroit, a lease for the water system, a lease for the sewer system, as well as a water and sewer services contract with the city of Detroit for whom they will be providing services going forward. So that's my explanation of how we got to where we are today. Now, Jeff's going to tell you what it all means. <laughs> I got out of that. That's more time. Thank you, Mark. I'm Jeff McKean. I'm the general manager of the Southeastern Oakland County Water Authority. Uh, we are DWC's biggest water customer right now. We supply water to not only Huntington Woods, but about 13 communities in the, in the general area. Um, our involvement in this goes back a long ways. We've been pushing for an authority to be formed for a lot of years. Um, as Mark talked about the confidential uh, orders that were going on, the, the gag orders, uh, we were trying to get our foot in the door to get our input into those discussions because water customers really weren't represented. Mark's discussion really revolved around problems on the sewer system. And that was the big perception that the problems are sewer based. And the parties that they were negotiating with were primarily sewer customers. The counties do not buy much water at all. Oakland County buys about this much water. Um, we buy a heck of a lot of water. Water customers are, are there's 84 of us um, as opposed to just a handful of the counties. And from a one a practical perspective, I can see why the judge would want to work with a handful of people because it's a lot easier to work with three people than it is with 85 people. Um, but at any rate, the, the memorandum of understanding that came out uh, really was kind of silent on most water issues. It did have some very important governance issues though that we are uh, starting to structure today. And the big things in there are the structure of the board. The, now the, each county, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, have one board representative. The city of Detroit has two. There's a sixth board member that represents the other areas that DWCD serves that are not included in the above. So they've, DWCD serves some uh, areas in, in Monroe County, Washtenaw County, St. Clair County. That, that person represents those areas. So they've got a six-person board who is in place, has been in place, so oh, four or five months or so. And their decision-making structure was set up so that they have to have a supermajority, five of the six of them have to agree on any major issue. And the major issue would be things like budgets, things like rates, things like capital expenditures, things like bonds, and the issue at hand today is a selection of a chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. Any of those decisions would need five of the six votes. The intent there was to force cooperation because no one party can do it all. You need to have those five votes. You need to find a way to get those five votes. I'll loop back to that a little later. The other important features of the lease were the, the, the payment that Mark alluded to, that the customers are paying to the city for use of the system. That's a $50 million annual payment. As Mark said, that's not all paid by the suburbs. Detroit pays part of that to themselves. Um, there's also a $4.5 million annual payment that's being uh, provided to set up what's called a water, uh, W-R-A-P, Water Resource Assistance Plan, Water Residential Assistance Plan, RAP, uh, that is going to provide a means of helping low-income people throughout the DWC service area, or the Great Lakes Water Authority service area, not just in the city, to provide help for people who need help paying their bills. They've also uh, agreed to provide accelerated pension payments to the city of Detroit. That is one of the critical areas that's being discussed right now is what is the pension liability. If any of you have any experience with pensions, we have pension plans um, for SACWA. I'm also the general manager of SACWA, so we have pension plans for SACWA. Every time you look at them, the number's different. Even if it's yesterday and you looked at it two days ago, the numbers are different. And one of the things we're trying to do right now is go through and figure out what exactly is the unfunded liability and who's, who's responsible for what piece of that. As that's going on, we have agreed, the customer or the, the, the parties agreed that there would be an accelerated pension payment, payments made to the city 
um, to try and speed up the funding of this unfunded liability. There's a whole lot of other things as well, a lot of, a lot of details. If I piled the leases up, which I have in, the, in my office, they're about that, that high. So there's a ton of detail in there. But those are really the important things that are going to affect the, the suburbs, how those people are appointed to the board, how they make decisions, and what the, the financial numbers that are baked into the pie. The um, GLWA is not operational yet. They do have a board. They do have articles of incorporation. We do have the leases. But there's still a couple things getting in the way. The target date is to be up and running on January 1st of next year. Um, they've got to have a number of things done, most of which are done, but the pension, there has to be an agreement on the, those pension costs. That's uh, one of the two outstanding issues. There's a lot of work going on right now to figure out exactly what those costs are and then try and figure out from there who should bear those costs. Mark alluded to the problems the city has with some of their systems and their infrastructure, some of their HR issues. If you can imagine looking at a pension system that is not just for DWSD, it's for all the employees of the city of Detroit. And if you look back over the last 30 or 40 years, there's a lot of people that have worked for the city of Detroit. So there are now people combing through all those records to try and figure out what portion of that is DWSDs, and in turn, what portion of that should be charged to the customers, as a, to the suburban customers as opposed to the city. We also have to get all the agreements that DWSD has assigned to the Great Lakes Water Authority. Um, to me, that's pretty much a no-brainer. I have a, a, we have a contract that requires us to buy our water from DWSD for a 30-year period. We're in year four of that, so we've got 26 years left in our, in our contract. Before we entered that contract, we did a lot of due diligence and we even financed the study to figure out what it would cost us to get our own water supply from Lake St. Clair. Sort of the Flint approach, although we would have done it better if we did it. Um, <laughs> trust me on that. Uh, that did not make any, any economical sense at all. It was uh, a very, very bad investment. So with that being looked at, we decided we needed to enter into a long-term contract. Um, and that contract, we have assigned that to the, to the Water Authority. Most customers have, a few have not. And the final thing they need to do is get all their bondholders to agree to assign the debt to the new authority. That again should be a no-brainer. The new authority should have much better credit worthiness than, than Detroit does or did. Um, but there are still some issues there they need to work through. So those are really the, the two big issues they need to work through between now and January 1 to get this thing up and running. Now, basically what's gonna happen, assuming all those conditions get met, is on January 1, we're gonna have two organizations. We have one today, the DWSD combined Detroit retail, suburban wholesale system, and we're gonna break that up into two organizations. GLWA is going to own the water treatment plants, the sewage treatment plant, all the big pipes that connect the water treatment plants to the pump stations, to uh, like the SACWA systems, customer systems, all the big sewer interceptors that collect the sewage from our cities and our counties and take that down to Detroit, that will all be owned by the authority. A new DWSD that would be just focused on the city assets, so it's all the mains, all the pipes in the city, um, and how to fix those, how to take care of those. So they'll, that will be their responsibility. From my perspective, that's one of the most important things about this. Right now, you've got a very unwieldy organization. They've got lots of problems. Mark alluded to the problems on the sewer side. On the water side, particularly inside the city of Detroit, they have a huge problem with unaccounted for water. They have a lot of water, they don't know where it goes. It leaves the plant, does not get sold. It just disappears someplace between here and there. They have a lot of problems. You've probably seen that in the paper over the winter with water main breaks, a lot of problems with hydrants that are broken. They go to firefighters, go to, to fight a fire, they can't get water out of a hydrant. Um, and they've got a lot of payment issues, a lot of non-collection issues. So one of the big benefits from my perspective is that those issues are gonna be not our problem anymore. They're gonna be given to this new organization, the new DWSD, and they're gonna focus on that. The Great Lakes Water Authority can then focus on the larger issues, making the water plants run effectively, making the sewer plants so that it's finally in compliance, run efficiently, and remains in compliance, and that everything's well maintained. It'll be a lot easier to focus on those issues when you don't have those other issues, uh, particularly the ones with the sinkholes and the broken fire hydrants in the paper and the press and distracting you all the time. 
having the ability to focus is, is a huge, huge benefit, and that'll result in much improved service from the customer's perspective. Another benefit of having GLWA there is that that should be a more credit worthy organization than Detroit is. If that is in fact the case, the cost of borrowing money, which is almost inherent in any large utility, you need to borrow money to, to do your major construction projects, will be lower over, the, over time. And again, that should help to mitigate our rate. The third piece is that we'll finally know what it costs to provide a service. As Mark alluded to earlier, there's always been a lot of confusion, um, partly by design in my opinion, Mark, that might not be a widely shared opinion, but partly by, at least in my opinion, by design of Detroit trying to have a system that's very hard to see, very hard to understand. But with this new organization, we'll have a separate accounting system. We will know exactly what it costs to run this Great Lakes Water Authority. My suspicion is it'll cost a lot less once we get this all figured out, both in terms of people and in terms of the other costs. So we'll finally know the true cost of providing a service. So that's why we've been such a big proponent of the Water Authority is that it gives us more control than we've had before, not perfect control, right? I would love to have control of everything. That's the type of person I am. I, you know, I, I take great pride in, in running SACWA and having control over our own destiny. Now, in this arena, we've got to cooperate and work well with our neighbors. There's no doubt about that. We can't do this ourselves. But we will now have representation on the board, better representation than we've had in the past, better numbers than we've had in the past, with an organization that's able to focus a lot better on one core service and not worry about oh, everything else under the sun. We'll have an idea of the costs. And we should finally have a management team that's well supported in terms of their systems, has autonomy that they can make decisions, has the information at hand so they can make decisions. And we should wind up with a much, much better running utility. So we are really excited about this. Um, I was here, Claire, about a year ago talking about this concept. And I, my statement then was, when you, if an authority is formed, that will be good for us. It hasn't quite come to fruition yet, but it's on the road to getting there, at least in my opinion. Now, having said that and been very positive, we do have some issues. Uh, Mark and I were talking a little bit before the, the, the presentation here tonight, and the, we have a brand new board. The Board of Water Commissioners is going to be out of business at the end of the year. They had improved a lot in the last three, or three to four years. As the counties were able to name their own people, we got better people on the board uh, who had better backgrounds, were more professional in, their, in, their, um, in their, how they ran things. We now have a brand new board that don't have any background in this stuff. So um, several of us are working on trying to educate them, uh, particularly on the water system. People, again, focus on the sewer stuff because it's a little bit easier to focus on the sewer stuff because there are fewer customers. So uh, the water customers, we spend a lot of time fig trying to influence the, the new board members and trying to educate them about what it means to be a, a world-class water system. Um, this having five votes out of a six-member board is going to be an interesting challenge. Uh, and again, that's required for any major decision. Any, anything substantive needs five votes out of the six. The one issue they're wrestling with right now, and it's really the first issue they've had to wrestle with. Up until now, there's no, there are no employees for the Great Lakes Water Authority. They're not really doing anything other than getting organized and getting ready to begin operation on January 1. The first big decision they're faced is trying to hire a, they call it a CEO, it's basically the person in charge. And they're really struggling with that. Um, they had a meeting last night to try and make a decision, wound up with a 3-3 tie. And it's really hard to see how they're going to get from a 3-3 tie to five votes to select somebody. So that's going to be very interesting. The next meeting is Monday afternoon on that. Um, and it's also been very interesting to try and influence that process. Um, and again, as water customers, we have a little bit of a different perspective than sewer customers do. I am one of four elected um, co-chairs of a technical advisory committee. The water customers get together every quarter and address issues that um, are of mutual concern to us. Primarily, uh, it's how to influence EWSD. Um, and 
we have spent a lot of time on that, particularly over the last month, and we've got a really good person that's running the organization right now. Sue McCormick is, a, is the uh, general manager of DWSD. She has done a tremendous job. Uh, this will sound like a paid political advertisement for Sue McCormick, and Helene partially it is for your benefit. Um, she's been there about three, three and a half years. She's a tremendous person, has done great things. Their costs are a lot lower than they were three and a half years ago. Their headcount has been going down steadily for four or five years. Um, and their service, from a water perspective, I like to ignore all those sewer things that Mark worries about. Um, from a service perspective on the water system, they're very, very good. We get everything we need. We've got um, great information at our fingertips on my phone, on my computer. I know exactly what's going on all the time. If we ever have an issue, we can pick up the phone and things get resolved, basically like that. Um, so we have no complaints about the current situation. So we've been lobbying very, very heavily on behalf of, of Sue McCormick to continue on. Um, and there's a lot to be said for you're trying to make a lot of change in a short period of time. Some continuity would be greatly, uh, would benefit, the, the whole system would benefit greatly from having some continuity. So we're really excited that this is on the verge of happening. It's been a long, long road. It's been very frustrating at times. Um, I'm the type of person that, you know, I think I know what's right and we're gonna push for that. Uh, but we do have to worry about a neighbor's perspective as well. So we spent a lot of time on the water customers. We've got 84 of us trying to get us all on the same page. Sometimes it's like herding cats. Um, but we've got to, it gotten to the position where we've got a good relationship with DWSD. We don't have the kind of regulatory compliance problems that Mark talked about. Um, the water, we're blessed with a very abundant supply of water. From our perspective here, I'm also very uh, blessed by my forefathers that were in my job before me. We date back to 1954. So the authority was born the, the, about the same year I was. So we've got a great system in the ground that provides us almost, I don't want to say infinite, that's a little too hard, hard, much of an overstatement, but supplies great flexibility. So Detroit has five water treatment plants. If we lose one or two of those, we wouldn't even know the difference because we can take water from an, any number of other places. We've got our own storage, we've got our own pumps, so we're well set. From a quality standpoint, the Detroit water is about the best you're gonna see. Um, that's always the first thing I do when I come home from vacation is get a glass of water to drink because it's always better here than it is anywhere else. So we're really excited that the authority is almost in existence. I'll be a lot more excited if everything falls into place and we've got an organization on January 1. It should be seamless to everybody. You guys should not see anything at all. From our perspective as a water customer that we're gonna deal with the same people we've always been dealing with, but we'll be dealing with people who have focus. They're able to focus on what's needed for an authority as opposed to what's needed for the Detroit residential customers. That'll, that'll be the big thing, that benefit for us. So at that point, I was gonna stop. There are tons more details. Both Mark and I have been you would not believe how much time we spent on these, uh, these issues over the past couple of years. But I thought I'd stop here and see if anybody has any questions. <laughs> Please, yeah, sure, one absolutely. One so, one, okay. I did ask to take the vote on behalf of all of you. Come on up here and so I can. Okay. As Oakland County Commissioner, I did take the vote for us to join the Great Lakes Water Authority. And one of the things that I don't think is fully clear, that $50 million service fee. Initially, when the bankruptcy process, um, Oakland County, the suburban customers were mandated or ordered by Judge Rhodes, you must pay this $50 million. And that money was gonna go into the city of Detroit for their operations. And the, you know, the county said, no, 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 no. And part of the negotiation was to take this $50 million service fee and put it back into the system to invest in the infrastructure. You know, we always talk about infrastructure, our roads. And so that money is going directly into the system. And what that will allow to do, for example, if you take that $50 million as a debt service fee, you could bond out a lot of repairs and invest in the operations. And that's a critical piece. 
Um, the other piece about separating the Detroit system from the suburban system. The Detroit types are, are older, the original. They do require more maintenance, repair, infrastructure change. We as suburban customers don't have to own those problems anymore. They're separate. They're not part of the you know, Great Lakes Water Authority. So I thought that, that was an important piece. Um, you should know that presently our Oakland County appointee is our deputy, one of Brooks Patterson's deputies, Bob D Datto. He is a whiz at municipal finance. He spent a lot of time looking at numbers. Um, and so he is a strong appointee for us right now. And another piece of the structure of the board, historically when it was just DS, DWSD and you had two Wayne County, you had two Detroit, so the suburban representation, we never had much of a voice. And so by making it a super majority of five votes out of six, it does give It'll be challenging, but it gives a stronger voice to each place that's voting. You know, it's going to be hard to get the five, but you're not going to have one faction outweighing another. And that was, that was an important thing. So. That's, that's a really good point. I intended to mention the $50 million. And as, as Helene said, that's going to be applied to improving Detroit's infrastructure, which helps us from a water customer perspective. If they fix their leaks, we'll have less water that we have to produce in plants, and that will cost as well. Yes, sir? With the link now coming back into the system, is that going to decrease costs for everybody else? It doesn't have any effect on that. For, so, for a short spell, it will. Yeah. But if you sell it more water, it doesn't cost more to make more. Right. Um, so that's, it gives more into the system, it puts more revenue into the system. Right. I think when the Fulton Junction County lost it, was about 10% of the, the water base. Mm -hmm. So water rates went up about 10 percent. Yeah, well, yeah, the overhead remained the same. Right, right. Okay. So that's a good thing. It, it, it's a good thing for everybody. Having them leave was a horrible thing for everybody, including the residents of Flint. That was one of the worst decisions I've ever seen in my life. The governor, you can thank the governor for that. At least that's my opinion. Um, so that'll that will help. Now, you know, Flint. They. They're probably going to be connected longer than they say they're going to be. They're talking about nine months. That'll probably be a year and a half at, at, at least. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. You, they're just not very well run. Uh, but this will this will help everybody. Ourselves, from the revenue standpoint and the residents of Flint, they'll be rid of the, the terrible situation they're in. Yes, sir? Yes, ma'am. So the answer to your questions is sort of yes, no, and yes. Um, a, it's, it's built as an integrated system right now. So if I look at where our water is coming from today, so the stuff that Claire's going to refill my pitcher for me at some point in time, okay? Um, that, none of that goes through pipes that this are in the city of Detroit, okay? But there are other customers that would be closer to the east side, let's say, that are getting water from Waterworks Park. That water does go through pipes that are in the city. So as part of this division of the two entities, or the one entity into two, that people have gone through a very detailed study and figured out well, which pipes are going to go to whom. So that stuff's all out there. It's all been planned out. This is an incredibly detailed effort. We were part of that in a, in a couple of areas. So that's all been mapped out. Um, but there are some pipes in Detroit that are going to be used by the GLWA, both on the sewer side and the water side. There are some interceptors on the sewer side. Um, so it's, it's a mix of things, but that's all been worked out. Um, it's all documented in these big, thick leases I was talking about as to what goes with whom. But it's a real mishmash. As you can imagine, this thing's built up over 100 years, and now we're trying to separate them. Other questions? Yes, sir. Could you explain what the intersections are and how they work and are integrated with the accessibility infrastructure? 
You want to handle that one, Mark? Yeah. I try and avoid sewer issues at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> There's a short answer, a long answer. I'll try and give a middle of the road answer. When the city of Detroit was first growing, there was no sewer system. And the city of Detroit, if you look at a map, there are no streams, there's no creeks, there's not a single water body that passes through the city of Detroit other than the Rouge River and the Detroit River. The reason for that is, is as the city grew, communities developed along these dozens of creeks that once were in the city of Detroit. Fox Creek, uh, Baby Creek, yeah. Connor Creek, I mean, they're, they're, they're legion. And as they grew, all the sewage went into the creeks. And cholera was breaking out in the late 1800s and people were getting deathly ill and they realized they couldn't leave these open sewers traversing the city. So they enclosed all these streams, all these creeks, all these drains, and directed it in a closed pipe right out to the Detroit River or to the Rouge River. So they pushed the problem downstream, but they were getting water still from the Detroit River. And it got so bad after, after the city continued to grow and grow and grow that the water intake was becoming contaminated. So what they did is they built interceptors. What interceptors basically do is they intercept the flow that goes through those enclosed drains, creeks, streams. It's installed underneath them. So, and they put a hole, for simplicity's sake, in the old enclosed drain, and when the flow's going through those drains, they drop down, it drops down into the interceptor, and the interceptors carry the flow down to the wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant, I think, was built in the 30s or 40s. So these, that's when the interceptors were built, and they started carrying all the sewage down to the wastewater treatment plant. It works just great as long as the interceptors aren't full. But when it rains, because rain and sewage all go in the same pipes, the interceptors get full, <coughs> And these old drains, these old creeks, these old enclosed pipes, they still go out to the river. That's your combined sewer <coughs> overflows. So what interceptors are, they're very large pipes that intercept the sewage that would otherwise go out to the Rouge River or Detroit River and carry it down to the Detroit Wastewater Treatment Plant. There's, there's the Detroit River interceptor. There's the Northeast, the, the what is it called, the uh, East Arm something something east arm there's the Rouge River interceptor there's there's about a half a dozen large sewage pipes and those large sewage pipes those large interceptors are what all the suburban communities connect to so that's what interceptors are and that's why they're called interceptors Yes, sir. One, one question is, I mean, how are the sewage rates billed as opposed to the water rates? If you get a bill for water, you don't get a bill for sewer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like an 18 part question. I'll, I'll take my part and then Claire's got a part and then Mark and May have a part. So the bill you receive at home is called a water bill, but it's, it's very little water costs for it. It's, it's mostly sewer costs. Your water costs, in turn, have DWSD costs, have my costs, Sockless costs, and have costs of Huntington Woods of operating their own system. That Huntington Woods owns all the mains in the street. They've got to repair those. They've got to replace those, as, you, as you've seen this summer. So all those things go into the water costs. The water is, Claire, do you have a, a <coughs> off-the-cuff feel for what it is out of yours? I should know that, but I don't. It's, it's yeah. probably 30, 35% would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just a, a semi-educated guess. Um, and then, you know, each inside the water bill, there are those components. Detroit is the biggest component, my cost, and then, and then Huntington Woods cost. Um, the reason we're in there is trying to lower your Detroit cost, so we have water storage um, towers and tanks available. So we buy water uh, during the nighttime hours and take it out of storage and re re at least in the summertime, take it out of storage and return it to you uh, when you need it as you get up in the morning and you can come home from work. So we have a fairly flat profile, demand profile from Detroit, so we get a better rate than we would otherwise. So Clara or Mark, do you want to talk about the sewer rates? Yeah, sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're gonna be sorry when we're asking questions. And to add a little bit about what, what Jeff said, I know a little bit about water rate making, but not a lot, just enough to be dangerous. The, um, the farther away you are from the city, the higher your elevation, and the larger your peak demand on the system, the higher your water rate is. And water rates are easily, easily measured because of all the water's meter. They know how much you're going to use. They know what it's going to cost to produce the water. And so they set your rates prospectively based on your distance, elevation, um, and, your demand. and your demand. And that's how each community gets, they, 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 they project you're going to use this many units of service. The revenue requirement on the water side is going to be X. So you get this piece of the revenue requirement, that's your rate. It gets converted into a commodity charge, so much per thousand gallons or thousand cubic feet that you use. On the sewer side, it's a lot more complicated. Some communities have, are, are, their sewage is metered through sewage meters. Other communities, they are not. I'm not going to talk about the ones who are not metered. It's just a, f a made up system to estimate the sewer demand and they make up the numbers and the numbers are so small in the overall system that it, it doesn't really matter that much to the overall system. On, on the, for the metered customers, what we realized after years of doing the most complicated rate making process that, that I won't go through, we came up with a new, this is just the last several years, we came up with what they call rate simplification. We know what the revenue requirement will be for next year to run the sewer system. It'll be $400 million. We know how much, we know how many units of service each community has used historically. You look back over 10 years. Because at the end of every year, we used to look back and calculate the flows and calibrate the meter. So we have a really good history of what every community uses, at least on the meter commu metered communities, in terms of sewer s services. There's all these little factors that go in there. You know, the storm water that goes down the drain, we can't measure that. And, but anyway, we know what everybody used over 10 years. We know what the unit of service is. Your, Share is your historical demand over the total demand of the system. That's your percent. And that share was fixed for five years. So every wholesale customer rate is set for a five-year period. And the only thing that varies is the revenue requirement for the upcoming year. How much do we plan to spend on fixing and maintaining and operating the system? That's the only thing that changes in the rates. And it's really simple now, and that's how it's been done, and that's how it is being done. Every five years, they will relook, they'll do a look back, and they'll check the numbers, what the shares of all the communities, make sure they were getting it right. And if they did get it right, they're not going to look back. They're going to just change it prospectively and adjust the rates that way. But that's basically how it's done. And that, again, is a, is a charge to the county yeah. that charges Huntington Woods. So there's everybody's, these are, the rates that you see are very complicated. And, and one thing you should note, the sewer rates now are fixed. And the, at the county level, there are different entities, different groupings. We're part of the GWK drainage system. So we're one piece of the county piece of this whole puzzle. And so the, the, the GWK group, we got together, we decided to try to even out our costs, because we also need to look at our costs as part of the county's costs, because it all gets divided up. And so we've met and decided that we're going to try to stretch out our period, not get to five years, although I think the goal is to get to five years, starting with two years, this year, looking over a three-year period to try to come up with some kind of a more, um, a, a better way to budget this because all of the sewer side is fixed. It's, it's not going to change within that five-year period. The county also is looking back. We've asked them to take a look back, but not on, on a, but we want to stretch those payments, that, that expectation over a larger period of time. We think there'll be less volatility in what we owe. But remember that the cost that goes from GWSD or the Great Lakes Water Authority in the future is again one piece of that pie. Everybody tacks on their piece. So 
Detroit Church or the, the Great Lakes Water Authority will just say it's rain. The county needs to look at their infrastructure, what they need to do. We get a pass to look at all of their needs in terms of, in our case, treating that water. If it doesn't go in, if the interceptor does, doesn't work, it, we have too much to go into the system of clean. So there's all of these pieces then get put on the rate that's given to the county by Detroit or by the Great Lakes Water Authority. But those are fixed rates on the sewer side. On the water side for Huntington Ward, um, while a larger and larger portion of that bill to Chautauqua is uh, fixed, uh, thank you Jeff, has been able so far to keep our city of Huntington Ward rates much less. So the fixed rate from BWSD was what? 60. 60 percent, yeah. 60 percent? Right. Um, Chautauqua has um, put a 1 percent fixed rate 10. on Huntington Ward. 10 percent. So does that all understand what a fixed rate is? That means that if nobody in Huntington Ward, if everybody decided to go away for a week, the whole city decided to go away for a week and no one turned on their water, we didn't have any leakage, nothing, we would still have a certain amount of money that we had to pay. So we're very fortunate because we are not faced with 60% of our costs being fixed. We only have 1%, which makes it a lot easier. But on top of that, we have our anticipated usage, which comes from software has kept them all these records for all these years. So we have that piece. So your water bill is a fixed, partly software's fixed rate, partly our usage rate, partly what we estimate we need to spend to maintain the water system. Then that piece that comes from Oakland County for the George W. Kuhn drainage district cost and our need to maintain our sewer system, which as you know, right now, we're busy doing a cleaning project. That has to be borne by the cost of those water rates. So, a water rate in quotes. So it's kind of, it's, it's layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, and we sit and spend a lot of time waiting for coming out with a, with a final number. And it doesn't, part of it's a pass. And part of it is based on water usage, so that if you would use less water, we may have a, conceivably we could have a shortfall. We hope we don't. But that's one one of the reasons that the water authority that BW uh, that the Great Lakes Water Authority or DWC has been moving away from just doing it on a usage basis, because there are fixed costs that go on and on and on and on and on. And as usage goes down, which it has. We figure that from the storm last year, I, I have kind of a bet with Tony Lehman that our water consumption will drop just about 5% just because of the storm, because of all the people who have replaced basement toilets, new washing machines, because every time you replace something that uses water, it's more uh, water efficient, which means it uses less water, which means the demand on the water system is down, which means less revenue. Which is why I want you all to drink water. Which is why <laughs> Jeff threatens to go around and open hydrants around <laughs> in all of the hospitals. Does that also mean that there are less drainage issues? Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay, so it hopefully will be something that you wake up a year from now and think back, well, we heard, went to this talk and never heard anything since January about this. That, that's a good thing. I strive for invisibility. Um, I, if I'm in the paper, either running soccer or soccer, it's because we've done something wrong. Okay, so my, my best day is when nobody knows who the heck I am, and I, I'm okay with that. Um, so hopefully a year from now, you won't know who's in charge of who's on the board or who's in charge of the GLWA. It'll, it'll just be so quiet, you won't even know that anything's going on. That, if that happens, that'll be a, a tremendous sign of success. But it'll be a kind of sign of success that you, nobody will notice. Okay, so if I'm right, think back a year from now, okay, and if you haven't heard any in six months, everything's great. Okay, so I'm hoping for silence this time next year. It sounds like a strange thing to hope for, but in my business, that's the best. That's the best you can. That's the best you can do. <laughs> well, but if there's a gag order, you're going to hear people like me complain about the gag order. <laughs> yes, ma'am. A lot. I, <laughs> I don't have a good effect on that, but um, those interceptors throughout the county. Yeah. You know, you just you put the phone to open the phone county, you open the phone intercept. It goes from eight miles all the way out into open intercept county and cuts a lot of that through. It's subsequent time. Yeah. That's one big guy interceptor. So you just get rid of the interceptor. There's the north interceptor east of Holland. So you just you get rid of the interceptor. And then there's a bunch of smaller types that are considered interceptors. There's the Columbus area and the Cullman area. I mean, there's, there's probably a dozen interceptors to around here. Mm -hmm. But El Rochelle is going to kill a bunch more. Oakland County's got one. Evergreen County's going to try to dump one. Wayne County's got a bunch of them. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of types to, to the job of them. So the county, <coughs> No, that that's a stormwater control structure. It, it's a it's a structure they're building to try and hold stormwater. Yeah, not a reservoir. That's that's my. Well, I mean, uh, we'd hate to. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's trying to control stormwater. Trying to prevent interceptors from overflowing into the East River during rain drought. Yeah, I don't want you to call it a reservoir because a reservoir to me implies a nice source of water. You don't want to. <laughs> You don't want to go there. <laughs> yes, sir. Is the red run the good part of the overflow? Or is that yeah, the red, red runs overflow from the George Coon facility. Yeah. Yes. Are the bunker flows automatic or are there gates that have to be open in certain circumstances? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're automatic unless they're under control. There's a detention gate that's constructed. They close the gate, they force it into the detention retention basin, and when the storm ends, they open it up and dewater the back end of the system. When, 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 everything out, works, when everything works properly. Right. right. And, and, and unfortunately, the vast majority of outfall structures are not controlled. Right. But the ones that discharge large amounts of raw sewer to those roads are controlled. Yeah. So it's a huge variety. Everything you can think of is out there. I, I just want to talk about that because somebody at one point last year told me that Someone to open a gate. No, no, no. I wish it was that simple. I really do. Uh, <laughs> it's well, not. When you guys pay drainage districts, does not have any internet security. They, well, I should, they have a gate that will let the water, the sewage, go down to the city of Detroit, and that backs up if it is too cold. It forces it through the system, which is all garbage. Anybody else? Well, thank you for coming out today. And remember, if a year from now everything's quiet, that's a good sign. We'll have Jeff come back on the software. <laughs>